Welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, actually the third um, of a series of uh, uh, webinars like this. Um, the series is called Emerging Paradigm of on Technology Capability Upgrading. Um, this is, um, um, we got this idea for these webinars because we have been working for the last two years actually on a book which has realized now, it's a reality. Uh, the book is about the challenges of economic and economic catching up in emerging economies. Um, the book is uh, going to be published next June, the coming June 2021, actually, uh, by uh, Oxford <coughs> University Press. And uh, it's going to be open access, uh, at least after a few months, it's going to be open access. Uh, book, uh, we have a tremendous um, um, roster of, uh, of uh, people who write the different chapters. And, and today we have some of them. Uh, here to, to present some, some, some things. Uh, uh, today's uh, 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 topic is going to be um, on uh, emerging paradigms uh, of, uh, of this technology upgrading, uh, new, new ways of thinking about it, uh, more inclusive, more uh, green, greener, uh, and so forth. Um, the program uh, has four um, four different presentations. Um, a, our fourth present, our one presenter, we are not very sure if he will join because he is very far away and it's very late at night for him. This is a big problem. <laughs> he is in Australia. Um, so, so we are a little bit uncertain on whether John Matthews will, will join, but uh, definitely if those of you who are interested, we can... Uh, we can uh, talk about uh, his chapter. Uh, all other all other presenters are with us, and 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 they will come in this in this in in this way. First, we will call um, uh, Dr. Altenburg, uh, Tillman Altenburg. Uh, he is uh, from the German Development Institute that you all know, and he's heading a program um, that is called Transformation of Economic and Social Systems. Um, then um, if uh, John join us by that point, John Matthews, uh, Professor Matthews is from Mercury University in, um, in um, uh, Australia. Um, and his presentation is on uh, China, um, the greener strategies of China, uh, greener development. Uh, the third uh, presentation um, will be uh, uh, I think by Professor Maria Savona. Um, um, she, she is uh, from the University of Sussex, uh, SPRU, um, and, and with two uh, co-authors, Tommaso Chiarli uh, and Jody Thorpe, uh, also from the same university. Uh, Jody is from the Institute of Development Studies in that university. Um, and finally, we will conclude with um, uh, Professor Gabriela Dutrenit. Um, several, uh, there are several authors of this chapter, uh, Jose Miguel Natera, uh, Martin Pouchet, and Alexander Vera Cruz, uh, all of them from Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana of Mexico. Um, so as you understand, we cover a whole, a big, a big uh, a range of uh, of uh, geographies and, and, and that's why uh, it's very tricky because in Mexico it's six o'clock in the morning in Mexico City, uh, whereas in Australia is uh, really very, very late at night. Uh, meanwhile, we have all the editors of the book. This book is edited by five people and these five people represent the five universities that co-organize this event. Um, so, um, <clears throat> We have uh, Professor uh, J.D. Lee, Jeon Dong Lee, uh, and Professor Kyun Lee, uh, both uh, from the uh, National Seoul University and currently both uh, advisors to the president of Korea um, on economic matters and uh, technology policy and all that. Um, we have uh, Professor Rado, uh, Slavo Radosevic uh, from uh, uh, University College London, 
Um, and we have uh, uh, Professor Dirk Meissner from uh, the National Research University, Higher School of Economics in Moscow, uh, and myself. Um, I am from the George Washington University in uh, Washington, D.C., um, and also uh, uh, have a affiliation, a long-term affiliation with the University of Campinas in, um, in uh, Brazil. Now, I don't want to forget, but I will introduce him a little bit later. We have an excellent commentator at the very end. So each of these presenters will take a short time, uh, 10 minutes, maximum 15, to give us the, the flavor of, 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 of their work for, uh, for, this, for their chapter. But at the end, we have a very, very distinguished uh, commentator. This is Otaviano Canuto. Um, and, and when at the very end, after all the presentations, we will have him offer his comments on, on, on what he hears and what he sees in the chapters. And then we will open it in discussion. So our, our uh, intention is to only take maximum the first hour for the presentations and then have the rest of the of the meeting on questions and the questions will be between the panelists but also with the with the audience so so please the audience those who follow the event um please use your uh, chat function um or raise your hand um there on the background two organizers uh, uh guillermi uh cavalcante as as you see here and Mateus, um, um, who will sort of facilitate getting your questions to the to the uh, presenters and 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 uh, the speakers. So, without further ado, I want to to start this, uh, if you don't mind, and and I will invite uh, first uh, uh, Dr. Altenburg, Tillman Altenburg from the German Development Institute. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you, Nick, for the very kind <clears throat> introduction, and it's really a pleasure to talk here to this really global project. We're spanning um, Latin America, and then Australia, and then China, and Korea, and then European and U.S. scholars, etc. So this is a tr truly interesting global endeavor, and it's it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Let me share my screen. Um, can you can you all see it now? Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to uh, talk about is is uh, whether catching up as a concept uh, still makes sense today in a in a world where we where we have to rethink the way we we organize our economies if we look at at global sustainability. So the the story in a nutshell is this. Latecomer economies usually catch up based on borrowed technologies and business models from, from advanced economies through foreign direct investment, through technology licensing, through trade and importing hardware, etc. And uh, usually um, they are what Furman and Hayes called historical imitator countries. And um, But at the same time, we see that... Um, global warming and also other environmental crises reveal that we're currently on a clearly unsustainable path. We need a new techno-economic paradigm and that change needs to be radical and it needs to be fast, especially with regard to decarbonization. That means then that imitating technologies and business models from other countries that used them 20 years earlier is no longer an option, or at least partly it's not an option. Latecomers need to look for different pathways from the start. Now I discuss which lessons from the 30 years or so of catching up and leapfrogging discussion still hold and which ones, which ones don't. Um, what, we, what do we know about catching up? Latecomer economies, enter the global competition when others have already moved ahead, when others have developed capabilities, they have network economies, they have economies of scale, they have 
created brands with global re reputation, etc. So the early movers have enormous competitive advantages and being a latecomer implies manifold disadvantages. There's no level playing field when latecomers enter the market. But there's also an advantage of backwardness, as, as Gershon Krohn has called it, Latecomers can build on knowledge and technology developed by the incumbents, so they don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time and then build on, 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 on proven concepts. The empirical evidence is that catching up happens, but it's difficult. Most economies get stuck. There's the famous middle income trap, for example. Some are success successful, so it is possible, but it's not the norm. And, and what we see from the discussion is that successful trajectories go through different stages. There are different authors, Lim, Kim, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Kyun Lee, and, and uh, Kenichi Ono, and others who have different stage models. But essentially, it can be summarized as such. The first step the latecomer economy does is um, in the pre-catching up phase, that it acquires technology from abroad. It, it identifies, buys, installs technology, learns to use imported technologies through FDI, FDI and licensing, et cetera. And usually these are technologies that are essentially mature and, and sometimes outdated even. But then there's a kind of next step when they start gradually uh, master the technologies uh, deepen know-how, start to reverse engineer, adapt import technologies, so build more, greater, greater competencies. The focus here is process innovations, but still own limited domestic R&D is quite limited. And then basically at, at the most advanced stage where many, many countries never reached, is, is it's a kind of phase of innovation post catching up. That's when really indigenous R&D becomes very important. When countries start to diverge away from established trajectories and develop their own, um, their own uh, pathways. So the essence here is that and there's, it requires decades of imitations, both based on borrowed technologies and business models before some countries move on to chart their own innovative trajectories. So that's all the work that Kyun Lee does about the, the new uh, trajectories, but that is at later stages, at early stages, it's about imitation. Now, we need a radical green techno-economic paradigm shift. Many of you may know this famous graph here by the Global Footprint Web Network, which essentially visualizes how uh, Sustainable development measured by the human development indicators on the X axis uh, corresponds with ecological footprint. And what we see here is that all the economies that are rich are living kind of at a, on a high level of human development, but none of them is within the threshold of economic, ecological sustainability because they consume too many resources. There are other countries that basically con don't consume per capita too much resources, but then they are poor. And there's all economies in the world should be in this uh, bottom right quadrant, whereas, uh, which is about global sustainable development, where economies would be wealthy, but uh, in line with uh, planetary boundaries. And not a single economy is in that, that quadrant. So as countries get rich and wealthy, they overstep the environmental boundaries. Then let's delve in deeper into the challenge of decarbonization. What we need to see here is that, well, how emissions per capita need to go down. Of course, in Canada, US, Australia, they need to go down much more than in India. But um, a per capita, a per unit of GDP, all countries have to essentially uh, uh, reduce their emissions to, to one tenth of emissions intensity of GDP. And now there are calculations about how much we need to decarbonize this or reduce this greenhouse gas intensity. And there are different scenarios. If we assume 1.5 degrees global warming, then we would need globally to, to reduce greenhouse gas intensity every year by 6.2%. The different scenarios, 
take the median scenario. If we aim for two degrees warming, it's still 5% annual uh, decoupling of, of, of GDP from greenhouse gas emissions. What we currently have is 1% of decoupling. So a slight little bit of decoupling happens, but it's far, far, far too slow. And the same, not only the same order of mag magnitude applies for resource use more broadly, not, not the emissions. So what we clearly see is we need a paradigm shift that, that is radical and fast. We see no single economy worldwide is on track. We see that uh, um, we need new economic concepts that don't just look at capital productivity and labor productivity or total factor productivity, excluding resource productivity, but resource productivity needs to build in, in any kind of uh, economic decision making. That requires systematic pricing of resources, high carbon prices, but also pricing of water resources and others and other measures. We need roadmaps to phase out high carbon technologies like we have for uh, uh, traditional cars, for example, and phasing in of new technologies like, like electric vehicles or, or renewable energy or, um, sorry. All this requires deep changes, not just changes of some artifacts of technological artifacts, but systemic changes in the energy system, the transport system, the agricultural system, etc. We need to have full decarbonization within 30 years after 200 years of, of fuel-driven economic development. Um, what my colleague Hubert Schmitz called it is this is the first time in his history we face a deep industrial revolution that has a deadline. It needs to be achieved in an order of two, three decades. And it is driven by policies rather than technological breakthroughs and market forces. So it's a, it's a new type of revolution that we need. So what does that mean for, for catching up strategies? Firstly, latecomers need to deviate substantially from established unsustainable development models. Business as usual is not a role model any longer. So catching up in itself is a notion that we need to question. And catching up based on borrowing previous generation of technologies um, is, is incomp incompatible with the, with the need to abandon polluting practices very urgently. It's impossible to do that through decade-long phases of imitations based on foreign technologies. Furthermore, imported technologies are typically at maturity stages of, of the product life cycle because they are easier to handle they are kind of, there's a lot of codified and know-how uh, foreign investors use written off capital goals they often hesitate to employ new technologies abroad abroad when they <clears throat> are afraid of leakage of intellectual property rights etc so therefore these borrowed technologies, even are usually at a lower environmental standards than what is used in the advanced economies. All this in, involves a lot of risks of, of, of lock-in, becoming dependent on, on, on carbon technologies, with a loss of competitiveness, with loss of uh, stranded assets. Just Carbon Tracker released the, the newest report on, on, on how much on, on the economic costs of of of, um, of petrol states, for example, I mean, we had the discussion earlier with, about um, about Petrobras, for example. So the, there are big economic risks uh, in, in involved in this. Um, <clears throat> What does that mean now for catching up strategies? Some, some, in time, but some insights of the catching up research still hold. I would like to mention four aspects here. Firstly, uh, the technology transfer is not frictionless. It's not automatic. There's no unconditional convergence in terms of productivity. And strategy is needed to set target for technological learning, to assess technologies, to uh, to attract investments strategically with the folks and firms that fit the national strategy, to nudge them to adopt local suppliers, transfer technology, and, and so on. And to, of course, to strengthen the absorptive capacity. So all these innovation systems lessons are as valid as they have always been. The notion of leapfrogging ahead becomes even more relevant uh, because new opportunities arise in a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift means that uh, old competitive advantages are, are rapidly uh, um, uh, devalued. 
uh, one example that we're currently studies, studying is China's competitive success in electric vehicles. So China has never been very competitive in the automotive industry, but with the shift to electric, um, where uh, uh, all the major incumbents are in problems, uh, uh, China uh, used that very smartly to, to, to leapfrog ahead or at least clearly catch up. Um, also in green technologies, there are back advantages of backwardness. So, so even latecomers can reap the advantages and learn from Danish wind turbines or, or, or German solar panels or Chinese solar panels and borrow such technologies at lowest cost and then implement uh, renewable energy systems in their countries that access uh, enable, for example, decentralized energy supply. So these advantages are still there. Also, we need to consider that many capabilities and assets are generic. So um, some capabilities acquired in polluting industries are still useful in the green industries. For example, here's a little graph that shows how capabilities and assets can be either enduring or stranding or newly required. If you take the examples of combustion engines to electric vehicles, lots of the know-how of the automotive industries in terms of how to organize a, a supplier uh, pyramid and, and do automotive R&D and market cars and brand them, et cetera, all these uh, capabilities are still valid in the age of electric vehicles. But others like manufacturing capabilities, combustion engines and powertrains and parts, et cetera, are devalued. They are no longer valuable. And then others are newly required and the same holds for, for assets where fuel filling stations are stranded assets, but manufacturing kind of organizing um, uh, uh, supply chains, et cetera, are still enduring capabilities. So some can be used and, and some, some others cannot. So to end, um, in a greening world economies, latecomers need to have different strategies. They can exploit some of the advantages of backwardness and they, they can still extract lessons from the catching up concept. But clearly they need to skip or shorten the imitation phase. And that means entering original R&D earlier. They need to invest more in technology foresight because you can't just say, okay, I emulate what the forerunners have done, but you need to really pick and say, okay, which investments are future-proof? Where can I avoid lock-in? How do I, do I identify which of my capabilities and assets are enduring and which are stranding and where I need to invest in, in you? That all needs to be much more uh, in terms of directionality of technology policy. And, um, and it's essential, I think, to combine green transformation pathways, for example, the national determined contributions to the Paris agenda with technological upgrading strategies. So, so that means co-designing environmental and industrial policy, kind of rather than having this compartmentalized in different policy silos. So these are a few thoughts and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tillman. Um, uh, we will uh, continue with a paper uh, from Sussex, uh, Maria, Maria Savona. Yeah, uh, please, oh, Tillman, thank you, Nick. stop sharing your screen, Tillman. Yeah, I'm just uh, trying where. Okay, yeah. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll, okay, please give me one sec and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, Maria. Yeah, oops, sorry. Okay, uh, so hopefully you can see my slides. Thanks. Thanks again, Nick, for, for this invitation. And, uh, and I think um, it's great to be uh, sharing with you the content of our chapter to the handbook. But let me just... Um, Share. I mean, first of all, this is joint work with Tommaso Charlie and, and, uh, and Jody Thorpe. I think they're both connected. And uh, as you probably know, but, prob but for the audience, this is part of a larger project 
that was founded a, a few years ago by the IDRC and uh, that wanted to know more about the concept of inclusive structural change. And so this is what I'm presenting today is basically the uh, conceptual framework is so a little bit more abstract than what Tillman has presented so far. But this is basically the backbone of this project in terms of uh, uh, conceptual foundation, let's say. Very briefly, the project was uh, related to identifying variables, actors and interactions that affect not only the diffusion of a given innovation, but its impact on uh, uh, outcomes in terms of structural change, or where structural change I consider to be a very established concept, and inclusion. So the, the novelty was to see whether uh, the established concept of innovation and structural change would lead to inclusion or would be driven by inclusion, importantly, and identifying the trade-offs between these three uh, issues. Within the project, we also, uh, especially IDS, um, investigated, we took qualitative review of cases, uh, this uh, role of a number of actors and how they influence the outcomes, and there is a working paper on the IDS page, and also from the quantitative perspective uh, that uh, Tommaso and, and Amrita Saha have investigated uh, quantitatively how innovation structural change and inclusion are related over time. So the overall aim of this particular project was to come up with a foundational concept that would help uh, um, shed some lights on the political economy of inclusive structural change. And this is what I'm gonna uh, present uh, today. Okay, so what is the heart of the matter? And this is based on uh, quite a common concept uh, that we felt could be bridged somehow. So structural change is obviously uh, linked to economic development. Um, and sorry, I think I lost my slides. Can you see, can you still see it? Yeah. Sorry about that. Can you still see my slides? No. no. Uh, sorry, I had an issue with my laptop. Can you now? No. Are you sharing the screen, Maria? Uh, yeah. Now you Can are. you see it okay. now? Yes. 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 Sorry about it. It, it went, my, uh, my double screen went blank at some point, so I don't know why. So what I was saying is that some of these concepts are very established, for example, the role of structural change for economic development, and also the role of innovation as a potential driver of economic development separately. Um, what is probably, uh, we know that innovation, especially uh, innovation scholars know how innovation can be disruptive. And this disruption also has distributional consequences in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, obsolete jobs, in terms of low wages, in terms of uh, access to opportunities to innovate. We also know, on the other hand, that economic growth and structural change can also reduce poverty. It has happened and, uh, uh, and it will continue to happen. However, overall, uh, there is some, the, the, the evidence on the potential polarizing effects of innovation and structural change uh, are uh, also there and, and, and taunting. So um, the, also the idea to bridge these concepts comes from the fact that there is an emerging literature on inclusive innovation that is, however, uh, relatively loose in terms, of, uh, in terms of concept, and the evidence is not quite uh, unanimous in understanding how innovation can be inclusive. So uh, the idea was to investigate how inclusion uh, might affect innovation and structural change and the other way around. And this, is, uh, uh, this was the main, the heart of the matter, as I call it here. Now, uh, what we try to do is, from, uh, from a conceptual perspective, is, um, is trying to identify, uh, I'm gonna use this, probably it's easier. 
what we consider to be a sort of three-way chicken and egg problem. So innovation might induce structural change, but, but also might induce exclusionary outcomes, uh, as well as structural change. So what we were interested in understanding is uh, trying to unpack the direct effect of innovation on inclusion or exclusion, but also the indirect one that comes from the, the effect of innovation on structural change. So um, this will probably become uh, uh, more understandably uh, in a second, but ideally we, we were trying to um, identify all the possible mechanisms that uh, are at work here when, when looking at innovation, structural change and inclusion. And what we identified is uh, also um, both on the basis of the literature and on the basis of some of the evidence is that we can have a reinforcing mechanism between innovation and structural change. And this is the, probably the most established one. So innovation might often induce structural change, but also structural change can, uh, can induce innovation uh, when, uh, when it happens. More ambiguous is the, the link between innovation and inclusion. As we say, we might find a reinforcing mechanism, which what I consider here to be a sort of plus, a virtuous or vicious circle. One leads to an, an increase in one leads to an increase in another in the other one or a balancing mechanism, which, which is associated with a minus sign, which means what? Which means that innovation might reduce inclusion and inclusion might reduce uh, innovation. So ideally the overall uh, issue here is trying to understand the extent to which uh, innovation and structural change uh, might be exclusionary or inclusionary. I can see someone is also writing on my slides. Thanks for the contribution. <laughs> um, but um, so that's, uh, that's the idea. So uh, ideally what, uh, what we would like to uh, understand is uh, going through all the ingredients of what is underpinning this particular mechanism and try to understand what, to try to identify, to pin down all the uh, um, micro and macro conditions that uh, uh, start from innovation. We actually don't question what drives innovation, but what we uh, moved on was to understand what are the conditions uh, and the variables that affect diffusion and how diffusion uh, is linked to structural change. So uh, to, to have an example, for instance, these are all uh, variables, contextual variables that uh, affect the way innovation diffuses. Obviously, adoption and diffusion are, are related to what are the actors involved. And here in the best of the innovation system tradition, we also have public uh, and private uh, uh, actors but also what kind of interaction affects diffusion and the potential for structural change. So for example, power relations, proximity, a political voice and so on, which we don't uh, focus specifically in the chapter, but we consider as important. Now, importantly, what we consider here is a very, very broad um, concept of structural change. I mean, the uh, most intuitive way that we can define and identify structural change is the change in the sectoral composition of an economy. But here we also consider um, shift in productivity, shift in, shift in jobs, uh, changes in preference and consumption shares, uh, changes in formality, so shift to, from informal to formal sectors, uh, the role of entrepreneurs and so on. So whatever is is, is the outcome of uh, a broader concept of, uh, of innovation diffusion. And this is basically the uh, main message here is trying to understand what of these mechanisms, what of these actors and what are these variables have an effect on, uh, um, on inclusive structural change. What do we mean here? At the extreme of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, 
uh, graph, we might have, in fact, innovation and structural change that have mainly a local impact. <coughs> they might be inclusive, but they're not necessarily scalable. At the other extreme, we might have the classical disruptive innovation and structural change that has a positive income on growth, but is not necessarily inclusionary. So ideally, not only from the academic perspective, but also from the policy angle, we might need to steer uh, innovation and structural change towards something that is at the same time inclusive, uh, but, uh, um, but, not, uh, uh, but, but scalable. So there's not limited to local impact or to only select segments of, uh, of the economy or society. And that's the, uh, the main idea. So to do so, we basically uh, review a few, uh, a few literatures. And uh, what we found is that, as, as I was mentioning earlier, that a few um, dynamics are fairly established as the one uh, that goes from innovation to structural change or from structural change to innovation from the perspective of the fact that innovation requires the introduction of new technologies and therefore disrupts uh, the, uh, some of the sectors and, uh, uh, and uh, economic outcomes. What we do have is something that is fairly more ambiguous. So the literature that has dealt with uh, structural change and inclusion or innovation and inclusion. And here, um, as I said, here the literature is more ambiguous in the sense that it's not um, unanimously recognized that the imbalances that accompany structural change might have an inclusive um, uh, outcome. Um, so structural change might increase income inequality in the short run, but decrease poverty in the long run. And therefore the, the, the sort of uh, uh, dynamic effect is, uh, uh, is not uh, uh, you know, established. Also, for example, innovation can have an effect on inclusion, but what has been, uh, uh, the, the literature that has dealt with this is more within the, uh, um, the sort of uh, uh, concept of grassroots innovation or frugal innovation uh, that possibly remain sort of limited to, uh, for example, local experiments or, uh, or particular uh, products. What is really less um, uh, under-researched is whether uh, starting from a more inclusionary uh, uh, system might lead to um, more innovation. This is something that, uh, that there's relatively comparatively less in terms of literature and that could be usefully introduced in, embodied in this, uh, in this particular scheme. So uh, the question, and particularly uh, uh, Tommaso and Amrita in their papers, find, for example, that uh, having starting from an inclusion, a more inclusive uh, uh, economy might lead to more innovation. Uh, and ideally, what we also want to know is whether forms of inclusion uh, actually scale up to structural change. And this is not something that the literature has, uh, has uh, particularly looked at. So um, I'm nearly till the end. I mean, this is something that, so the idea was to um, trying to set up a sort of, uh, or identify research priorities more than setting a research agenda for, on, on, these, uh, on these issues. So from the policy perspective, let me just uh, uh, clarify. I don't think this is only useful for, uh, from the academic perspective. So identifies what are the mechanisms that link innovation, structural change and inclusion is not only interesting from an academic perspective, but it's important to understand them to have a handle on policy. That's, that's the main idea. So um, what we might need to do in, in the very near future is trying to support empirical evidence on the impact of inclusion and innovation. And this is something that we find particularly important. Trying to understand how to steer reinforcing mechanisms for uh, to make sure that uh, that inclusiveness is scalable and that in structural change doesn't really uh, uh, result in exclusionary outcomes. Um, 
also from the policy perspective, it would be important to identify tools and handles to mitigate the mechanisms that lead to a scalable but exclusionary innovation pathway. And this is uh, something that probably is, is particularly important in this particular historical moment. Um, also, uh, the idea would be to uh, steer and scale up the positive effect of innovation on inclusion. As I said, that those that remain uh, local and might not result in a virtual circle that is uh, that has an impact on the aggregate uh, uh, at the aggregate level. Um, the idea would also be to design a policy action that affects inclusion from the spatial perspective and from the perspective of mature uh, uh, industries. Something that has been relatively under under the, under investigated uh, so far. Uh, but also the idea would be to link up uh, innovation policy and industrial policy with macroeconomic redistributive policies. So the, the idea here is uh, the idea here is that there is so much of a of a gap or, or a sort of least opportunities to uh, provide a, a consistent and coherent policy uh, um, policy framework to make sure, for example, that uh, uh, macroeconomic redistributive policies allow not only to tackle income inequality per se, so fiscal uh, and redistributive policies, but this has also an effect on uh, um, how people uh, create opportunities for innovation. For example, affecting consumption patterns and demand led innovation might, uh, might fit, uh, might square the circle uh, of inclusive structural change. So um, I'll, uh, I think I'll stop here by leaving this uh, um, uh, issues for our research agenda. And I think uh, it would be great to discuss this in more extent in the discussion. Sorry if I went over, Nick. <laughs> okay, I'll stop sharing. I can hear you now. Nick, are you muted? Yes, thank you, Maria. No problem. Um, uh, these are very, very important issues. And I can already tell you that on the 15th of April, we have another major event with our institute in, in Washington, where the director of the National Science Foundation actually uh, has been invited to give a major keynote uh, speech exactly on this topic. And this is a major agency, of course, that funds research all over the United States, all topics except medical, perhaps, and nuclear. Um, and uh, inclusion is his major concern because our countries, of course, are wasting a lot of human capital uh, by not including them in this in this uh, in this enterprise. Okay, thank you very very much. Um, let's move directly to the the next one, the next and last presentation uh, by uh, Professor Gabriela Dutrenit um, from Mexico. Okay. Gabriela, can you? Yes. Very good. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And this is an opportunity to discuss uh, again these issues, uh, the, the, what we wrote in, in, the pa in the paper that is going to be included in the book. But because now we are still working and this is, uh, uh, we have a new project now working on this, trying to apply the, the framework that we developed in, in the case of Mexico, looking at more details to understand what we, we are, uh, I, I I'm going to present here. Well, this is a uh, this is this document was uh, uh, written by Jose Miguel Nateras and Martin Puchet and Alexandre Veracruz, who 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 are here also in this uh, seminar. So. Uh, we are talking about the technology capability accumulation in the case of developing countries, but then, well, there is a lot of literature on that. But when we look at the, at the countries, and particularly the countries that are in, in, the, in, in, in emerging economies or even developing countries with higher incomes, it, it is clear that the policies failed to overcome the middle income trap. 
but there is not a clear consensus on the uh, possibilities that the developing countries have to uh, overcome this, this situation and, and, and of middle income uh, trap. And then when we look at the input and output of domestic uh, technological capabilities, it is clear that it is not enough to look at this type of uh, indicators to understand the problem of technological capability accumulation and the problem of develop, development, because at the end of the day, when we are trying to understand technological capability accumulation and to, uh, to take the recommendation in terms of policies, what we are looking is for the development process. So, and the, well, the, the literature is very broad in terms of the nature of technological capabilities, concept, processes, taxonomies, level of analysis, even methodology, different type of methodologies. And then, but uh, we believe that when we look at the problem of the, the problem that the, the technological capability accumulation have in developing countries, uh, we, th we, we believe that the context in, on, in which the technological capability accumulation occurs are very important. And we are not the first to analyze the, the, the role of the context in this. And then when, when I'm talking about the context, I am, I am I am talking about the economic context, the, the environmental context, the social context, etc. No, so the, uh, we initially look at the the the, the, the work of uh, uh, Jorge Katz in, in his book, in actually 1985 in Spanish and 1987 in English, trying to understand the the my, uh, macro and micro levers and how they are interwined as as uh, um, and Maria said before, no, and he analyzes also how firms' economic and technology behavior res respond to macroeconomic uh, context. And later on, Freeman, in in his uh, working paper in 1995, he analyzed five overlapping processes that he he called them subsistence of society or affairs, like uh, science, technology, economy, politics, and general culture. And he argued. And he demonstrated in the case of, uh, particularly in the case of Brit uh, Britain, uh, how these systems are subsistent, are autonomous, relatively autonomous, but they interact and they influence the process of economic uh, growth. So he is looking at the, actually what Freeman uh, did was looking at the broad context in which the process of economic growth and development occur. And later on, well, uh, Veracruz, Arsa, um, several, several uh, other colleagues have uh, introduced uh, contributions looking at the context. Actually, the, all these analysis of multi-level analysis show a broader approach to the drivers of technological capability accumulation, including different types of variables, but mostly economic and so, uh, from the economic and social sphere. And so we argue that we don't know enough on the process of technological capability accumulation, but particularly we don't know enough on the relationship between technical, economical, environmental, social, and political indicators that, that uh, influence this process of accumulation. And then we try to focus in this paper in, in the effect of two broad spheres of subsistence of society at the Freeman's, uh, uh, term, with the Freeman's uh, techno, uh, terminology. And then we analyze Two, two big spheres, uh, te technical, economic, and environmental affairs, and the socio-political affairs. And, and we try to analyze how these affairs interact and co-evolve. But countries, and in our case, we analyze the case of 18 uh, Latin American countries, well, the, the evolutionary tra trajectory of the countries differs, and then combine these affairs in a different way. And then if what we are trying we, we try to do in this no we try no we we did in this paper no to identify different development profiles of Latin American countries in terms of this connection between the, the techno-economic and environmental efforts 
and the social political efforts and the process of uh, economic growth and then try to to analyze what are these the implication of this in terms of the technological capability accumulation and the policies to support the technological capability accumulation for uh, pro, uh, promoting uh, economic uh, development. And this is the conceptual framework, very simple, that we try to we introduce it here with this techno-economic enviro uh, and environmental efforts, which include the economic performance, the environmental factors, and and STI, and on the other side, the social, uh, social in indicators and dimension and political dimensions. Uh, let me move. So our our research design for this for this uh, uh, paper was to verify the existence of co-integration between indicators of the techno-economic and environmental effort and the social. Uh, uh, social political efforts and identify and estimate long run paths to determine country profiles. And for this analysis, we included uh, 18 Latin American countries from the period of 1970 to 2015, and we used uh, we use 13 indicators for, for this analysis of the first. So the co-integration analysis of variables within this first, is the, uh, they, they try to show the, 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 the links between the, the, these efforts of, over time. And the dependent variables that we use for this anali uh, analysis is the income per capita. And then based on that, we identify uh, the development uh, profiles of the countries based on this estimation of the long-term run. The third point uh, that I would like to, to stress is the difficulty to find the adequate and available data for, for this type of analysis. We, we use it, uh, the, the selection of indicators comes from a detailed analysis of the literature of innovation system, but we don't have enough uh, long-term indicator for this type of analysis. Uh, everybody knows uh, the, the problem that we have usually when we are trying to apply a, a model, a, a conceptual model, when we try to apply to the reality with, with data for that. So, so there is a, a problem, but following the, 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 this idea of Freeman, in, in this paper, 1995, about the recent history, history approach, we have to use the data that it, it is uh, available, but we have to, to have a broader uh, approach to this, to this data and try to combine this data with um, analysis uh, uh, of the history of the of the of the countries, the sectors, the context, etc. No. And then very, very quick, we use it, I said, we use a certain indicators, this type of indicators that we usually use for this type of analysis, openness indicator, labor productivity, also indicator of the STI input and output, research and development expenditure, etc. We included some of the indicators that were mentioned by Tillman in the first presentation related to the environmental impact on economic activities like re renewable energy consumption and CO2 intensity. Well, the, the indicator that we can access to them uh, on a long-term uh, basis. Indicator of quality of life related with the problem of the social inclusion or exclusion that were mentioned by, by Maria, the Gini index, uh, the uh, government expenditure on education, and other indicators related with the sociopolitical context, the corruption perception index, uh, index of democracy and autocracy, etc. And based on that, we analyzed the long run behavior of these uh, indicators and how these uh, indicators and the spheres, the social, uh, the techno economic and, and environmental effort, and which is here, and then the, the social political uh, effort, which is in the, in the vertical axis, sorry. 
And uh, we, we analyze how this, uh, based on, on the methodology on co-integration, we analyze how these efforts and the indicators within them uh, affect the, the, the evolution of the GDP. Per Gabriela? Gabriela? I, I think we lost her. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we live very nearby. And I have to tell you that something happened with the electricity here. So maybe it's, it's something with, the, with her electricity. I can call her. Oh, in uh, uh, okay. in Mexico, in Mexico City. So, OK. Um, I think. Uh, well, what? what Yes, in fact, she's she just write me that she had a problem with her electricity. Uh, Jose, uh, can, you, can you conclude this? Uh, yes, we are no problem. Yeah. My, my pleasure. Yes, well, um, as as you could see in the in the previous uh, slide, let me try to see if I can find the slide. But very quickly, please, because we. Okay. Are... Well, so I'm not gonna I'm gonna I'm not gonna present the slide, but just gonna tell you what uh, what this today yeah. about. Um, if you have the PPT, maybe you can show it. I think that she sent it, she's telling me now. But in any case, what we did was trying to organize these results according to the different um, country groups that she showed in, in the last uh, screen. And, okay, let's see if Guillermo can help. Okay. Great, there, there it is. So what we did is we tried to organize this considering both axes, as you can see, the, um, the grouping exercise that we did combines the, the results, of course, but at the end of the day, the determination of the um, inclusion in each of the country groups, um, it's determined by um, uh, the, this historic um, analysis that, that we undertook on the science, technology and innovation trajectory of these countries considering as well the um, STI policies that they have implemented. Can you, the, the next one please? So these are the three uh, main profiles that we can find um, using this long run path analysis. In the first one, we can see that there are some countries that are more biased toward the uh, technoeconomic uh, techno and environmental sphere development and are lacking the social political sphere. Those countries are Argentina, Chile, and Mexico, basically, where lower productivity has a positive impact on GDP per capita, but uh, it lacks a forward presence of SPS. This is very linked to what Maria Sabona was saying before regarding this interaction between innovation and inclusion, that it's not always going in the direction that we would like that to be. The second one, it's more biased to social political um, spheres and are lacking the technological, economic, and, and, and environmental sphere. In this country, we find the most, most of, the, of the countries in, in, in Latin America, in which we can see how particularly uh, supported by the, the last decade uh, policies, we have had a promotion in terms of uh, social inclusion and, 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 and the indicators that are included in the social political sphere, but still are lacking this uh, capability to produce new technologies and of course advance in this um, uh, paradigm, let's say that of catching up. And the next one, please. Finally, we have some more balanced systems that unfortunately are not um, as populated as we would like it to be. And here we could see uh, Brazil, Colombia, and Uruguay, of course, this uh, comes with the analysis of the 45 uh, last years and how they have uh, developed so far. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, um, therefore um, not something that we can project, but at least it tells how the countries have been developed over, over the years, right? In this case, we have these more balanced systems with, uh, in which both spheres are um, included in, in, the, in the developing strategy. And of course, we have this better impact on uh, the social political sphere and GDP per capita. The next one, please. Uh, can you conclude, please? Yes, just, we are just closing this. 
So basically, what, what could we learn from here? Well, here, first, um, we have many different development profiles of the, the relationship between the two spheres that could condition the technological capability accumulation process in, in countries when we have this broad perspective is heterogeneous as we would expect it, right? Um, we have some uh, uh, countries that have still um, different degrees of problems and, and advances on dealing with these problems, like limitations in the demand, supply and constraint, low private sector investment, short private and public venture capital, and so on. We have also, in general, if we look at the region, a weak balance between the two spheres that we have. Right, and this, of course, could have an impact if, if we if we consider this as a broad approach that links macro and micro interactions on the development of technological capabilities accumulation. So we need to pay more attention to this broad perspective because they are quite intertwined, and that could actually represent a problem or an advantage for countries' development. The next one. And um, the, the, the more general conclusion, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it here that, that, that we are um, taking out of this uh, whole exercise is that SDI policy strategy should not only consider this TCA, uh, this technological capability accumulation process only looking at the firm or at the micro level, but also combined it with this macro analysis in which we could create this uh, more violent situation between the micro and the macro interactions. Because uh, otherwise it might be the case that these problems that we have been facing over the long run could be like perpetuated in the, in the, in the next uh, run of uh, the STI policies and of course economic policies in general. So I'm gonna leave it here and if you have any comment, Thank you, Jose. Yes, we will have a lot of comments. Actually, I'm anxious to move on because we have several comments in the chat. We have hands up. Uh, people have questions. But uh, before we go there, we have a very, very distinguished um, um, a discussion of all, uh, of all the presentations. And uh, uh, this, uh, he is now my colleague at the George Washington University in, uh, in D.C., uh, but uh, Otaviano, we could not find any, anyone better actually than him for discussing these issues because let me just tell you what he has done, uh, which is difficult in a single lifetime. Uh, he is a former vice president and executive director of the World Bank, a former executive director of the International Monetary Fund, a former vice president of the Inter-American Development Bank, he is a foreign deputy minister for international affairs of Brazil's Ministry of Finance uh, and a former professor of the top two universities in, in Brazil, which is the University of Sao Paulo and the University of Campinas. He's also a colleague now with, with our group in Campinas. So um, I'll turn it over to him. I'm very anxious to, to hear what he says. Uh, Otaviano, if you can limit uh, uh, the time in order to, 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 to address some of the issues raised by the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here, Nick. Uh, uh, and also for giving me exactly the opportunity to read and enjoy as I did the, uh, the, 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 the four papers. Uh, I'll be very short because uh, first of all, the presentation have been very much uh, uh, covered the, the, the content of the chapters, but also because uh, we need to go on for the discussion. See, look, among the, the, the several satisfactions that I, that I had by reading the, the chapters, because they're good in themselves and, and I learned a lot, uh, it also you know, attracted me very much the, the uh, pursuit of co-evolutionary views. Uh, it's really a departure from a uh, 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 not so distant past in which many times the technology scholars uh, took innovation systems as self-contained ones, as self-contained systems. And all the four uh, papers have in common, uh, among other things, the idea of exactly seeing the technological uh, evolution as uh, a co-evolutionary process with other factors. 
Uh, I guess uh, Tillman has a very strong point about the risks of uh, of uh, of uh, lock it up <laughs> of uh, uh, logarithmic countries the, the the coming from behind getting locked into uh, 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 trajectories that are doomed to to uh, to disappear. On the other hand, of course, uh, we should keep in mind that the capabilities escalator from acquisition to mastery to innovation. Uh, means, uh, 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 let's say, uh, less stickiness as we move to the innovation side. Uh, not only the issue he points out is to a large extent sector specific, uh, and it, uh, but uh, as he approaches the issue of greenery and, and green energy and so on, he's on the spot about the risk of, uh, of uh, countries coming from behind being locked on into uh, trajectories they are to be faced. But uh, what matters ultimately is the evolution towards innovation. And at the innovation levels uh, of capabilities, they are less sticky than it is the case of uh, acquisition. But uh, the point, uh, I'd like to make two general points, and I will promise that will be brief. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a proposal, uh, in fact, of uh, uh, addition uh, of new lines of, of research. It, which is uh, the role of complementary factors, not technological, uh, and and uh, more precisely, not simply broadly speaking, institutional. The the four papers they they, they point out they they match, they combine the evolution of technology and institutions and politics and and this and that. But I I I I, I propose that we should as future steps to introduce, to take into account the microeconomic incentives. That is to say, how it is that the so-called institutions, the rules of the game, reward and penalize uh, the agents according to results. I'm referring here, you know, I, I can't avoid it. I'm a, basically a macroeconomist. And when I look at technology, I think of a total factor productivity, the measure of our ignorance, as the macroeconomists call it, okay, which have also non-technology aspects, namely efficiency, rules of competition, rewards according to results. Uh, so uh, Maria uh, must, I would say, can definitely complement uh, her analysis about the, the inclusiveness by also uh, checking how and, and, and uh, the microeconomic incentive, incentives, rewards and pen penalties uh, and the appropriation of results uh, reinforce. Because after all, we could not, we cannot lose sight of the fact that accumulation of technological capabilities is a result, is an outcome of institutional features that reward the investment in them in intangible assets. If we don't have that, uh, the, uh, we don't have accumulation of technological capabilities. And in fact, uh, the, uh, as all the papers uh, do a policy advice about moving into production baskets, thought to be more growth friendly or inclusive friendly or more green friendly, uh, the, the critical point that cannot be missed is the fact that countries unable to innovate in their present industries are unlikely to do so in new industries, which is the innovation paradox so much referred by colleagues of uh, ex colleague from the World Bank. So we need to, to look at the critical complements to innovation investment needed to realize the high potential returns associated with uh, the, 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 the capabilities. The range of firm capabilities required to undertake innovation to take it to the market. And obviously the required government capabilities for implementing effective innovation policies. See, my point in a nutshell, the neoclassical and the national innovation systems literatures must talk more because there is a common ground between them. And in what the experience uh, has shown uh, in, the, in the analysis of uh, the, at the World Bank is how uh, you know, we need to have the complementary assets and we have to look at uh, what impedes the accumulation of those complementary assets. I'm talking about here costs of doing business, trade regimes, competitiveness frameworks, 
capital markets, uh, intellectual property rights protection, or market, market failures that disincentivize the accumulation of knowledge. Uh, because these affect the returns and therefore the quantity of innovation investments. So we need to, I would say, to complement to, to Gabriela's uh, uh, taxonomy and so on, uh, components uh, relating to this complementary asset literature, which ultimately will make the difference uh, in terms of incentivizing the agents to accumulate capabilities. A final point uh, on, on uh, by the way, managerial practice as a key input for innovation must be in the picture as well. A final, uh, and just single point that I would like to make is since the middle income trap was uh, referred so uh, so uh, so often in, in the texts, I would like to to uh, share uh, 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 a little propaganda, but that's not going to take long. Uh, which is in the same uh, collection of Oxford of your books, guy. Uh, we had last December the launch of this book on the middle income trap, uh, edited by. Uh, Jose Antonio Alonso, Jose Antonio Campo. I have a chapter there. <laughs> and also making the propaganda of my book uh, that was launched exactly this week, which obviously contains a lot of, uh, of uh, stuff about the middle income trap. The middle income trap, ultimately, just to say, uh, there were several references, uh, of course, in, in the papers to middle income trap, associating it to the accumulation of innovation capabilities. But broadly speaking, what you will see uh, in the literature about middle income trap refers exactly to the presence or absence of appropriate macroeconomic incentives that I was mentioning. So the, the difference, the reason why correctly uh, highlighted by, by the papers, by two papers particularly, uh, the successes of China and South Korea in benefiting from the knowledge that's spilled over through globalization to build up domestic capabilities they are part of the explanation of why uh, Korea uh, overcame the middle income trap, why China is on track to do that. Uh, but also keep in mind that that was only possible because of the complementary assets, the domestic capabilities and the appropriate uh, uh, regime uh, that uh, incentivized the domestic agents to accumulate capabilities. So it's a call if we need to, to understand and, and, and think about overcoming the middle income trap, we have to deal with innovation, but also exactly with the structure of incentives that lead the agents to, to want, to desire, to accumulate innovation capabilities. Uh, thank you very much and congratulate the authors for the authors. So one final point, uh, I must confess that uh, 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 the point on geopolitical impediments to access to, to commodities, I uh, was maybe, uh, I, I, I think the, the, the fight will be on the technology side, not necessarily on the access uh, to uh, raw materials. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, I wish I could clap, but uh, we cannot. <laughs> um, I, I, I am sure there is a, a lot of issues that the audience uh, uh, wants to discuss. Um, so if there is anyone who wants immediately raise your hand, if, I don't know if I can see all the screens, but uh, if you use the facility, you can uh, to raise your hand, uh, I can see it immediately. Uh, Is Maria Savona there? Uh, Ma she raised her hand. Okay. Uh, Maria and Tommaso also is raising um, a hand. So uh, let's go to uh, Maria or Tommaso. Thanks. I just wanted to uh, to thank Otaviano for the great points. I, I, I might just try to. Um, respond with, with, the, with two additional points that I would like to, probably to, to interrogate him on that. I mean, yes, I mean, creative incentives, which is the, the, the main point that you're saying is uh, creating the structural incentives should be the main policy drive for innovation. However, um, from the perspective of innovation scholar who happens to be an economist as well, uh, the, the point is, 
for example, the, the, the eminent example of creating incentives is to grant property rights, intellectual property rights to inventors, right? Now, this is the one issue that creates incentives, but it also has uh, very exclusionary <laughs> uh, outcomes in, in the sense that it creates a monopoly position, it, it uh, probably slows down diffusion, and so on. So I think it's, it might be that a bit more complicated also to work out what kind of incentives you can create to direct innovation uh, at, at the microeconomic level. And, and this is something that probably uh, we will need to uh, work on uh, much more in depth. The second point that I had is the, the sort of, my perception is I was formed as a macroeconomic uh, uh, back in uh, back in Rome, and my uh, perspective when when uh, looking at issue of industrial policy or innovation policy is that is that there is a very large uh, lack of bridging with uh, with macroeconomists, and the one example that I mentioned in, in my presentation is exactly. Uh, the fact that a lot of innovation is driven by consumers' preferences and consumer preferences and consumption shares are very much related to uh, 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 redistributive policies or macroeconomic policies that, uh, uh, that, uh, that allow to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to increase incomes and so on, which incidentally would also uh, allow to buy more uh, expensive greener product as, as, a, as a trivial example. So the point is that macroeconomic policy is related to uh, austerity or structural adjustment and so on are eminently uh, against uh, any forms of innovation and, and, and structural change. So I think that there must be a bit more, I think more discussion and a bit more consistency with the policy um, objectives could be very useful in this context. Sorry, I'll stop here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Tommaso. Hi, <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for the, for the presentations and for the uh, discussion. Uh, I think it was a <clears throat> great discussion. Tavian, I'm gonna address also the, the, the questions uh, that come from YouTube briefly. Uh, but, um, no, Otaviano, I think, I think your call uh, to have more interaction between neoclassical uh, economics and evolutionary and structuralist and neo-Canadian uh, and all, all, this, uh, all these different sources of uh, um, heterodox non-mainstream economics is fundamental. And, uh, and, and this is something that, uh, that we, we, we definitely try to work on uh, in, in, um, in our own agenda. And, um, <clears throat> and, 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 and because there are different perspectives which are extremely relevant and which are complementary. But just to take the, uh, some of the points that, that Maria was making earlier, don't you think that the major difference here that we are considering is the usual uh, standard difference between horizontal and vertical policies. So the kind of incentives that you discuss are horizontal. And uh, if I understand correctly, and by definition, they would apply to all the population in the same way. And, and there is a problem there because when I think in my understanding of, of, of Tillman's appeal for directionality in, in policy and, and innovation is that we cannot be horizontal. Um, it's not about catching up all in the same way, raising the bar. We need to recalibrate. We need to change the structure. And to change the structure, um, if you want to favor innovation, which are green more than others, obviously you can do still with, uh, with, with, with taxes and, and market, market incentives. Uh, but to recalibrate in terms of income distribution, and in order to <clears throat> allow uh, marginalized people to, in, to be included in the innovation process and to use their talent, you need something which is not horizontal. You need something which is which is more uh, structural. And, and and you see, I mean, I've posted in the chat before a response uh, to, to 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 great <clears throat> comments. Uh, a number of, of papers that papers are coming out uh, from the classical microeconomists, um, looking at uh, at amazing data on the life of um, of inventors. And it is so clear that all those who have access to invent to innovate are those who are already have the opportunities to do so, 
already have been in Taj, have been already being in top universities, already come from from very uh, wealthy backgrounds uh, with 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 academic par- uh, parents. So the incentives for them are there, fine, but we need to equilibrate. I think if if we want to address uh, uh, the critical issues of of uh, uh, environmental sustainability and and inequality. Um, it. Quick, quick, quick uh, uh, response to the comments from YouTube. If uh, if I'm alone, it, just because uh, because they, they have less uh, uh, ability to inter- they're less included in the chat because they're watching in YouTube. But I think uh, we should we should uh, uh, we should cover these 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 uh, uh, questions even more importantly because of that. Uh, there was a question about I would like to know if the inclusion innovation is strictly related with sustainability or not necessarily. I think it depends on how we define sustainability. If we define sustainability in terms of the sustainable development goal. Definitely, because SDG 10 is about inequality, uh, <clears throat> SDG 9 is about uh, employment opportunities. So, a, 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 a broad definition that, that you know, was, was very welcome came, came from, the, from the UN in terms of the SDGs. Yes, it is sustainability. If it is only <clears throat> environmental sustainability that you mean, no, then I think, uh, I think we should think beyond only environmental sustainability, but this broader understanding of sustainability. And the question about smart city policies capable to promote inclusive innovation, <clears throat> yeah, I, think, I think it's a very good point. It's a very good point uh, because the, they tend to be inclusive themselves um, uh, smart city policies because they tend to break uh, this this uh, distinction between the the core and the periphery which is uh, which is obviously essential for inclusion so i think yes i'm not an expert but i think it's a very important point thanks i, I should stop here very good thank you tomas um uh, you muted nick uh, no i'm not muted no he's not muted uh, um uh, okay, something very quick because uh, Gabriella has her hand up. Okay, okay uh, yes. Uh, just, uh, just a very brief, I, I promise. When I, on purpose, referred to neoclassical economics, obviously, uh, I, I it was on, on purpose to be provocative, but I'm referring to the microeconomics of incentives, which include, uh, of course, the market failures and everything that are, that are, that are uh, nowadays, the broader concept of, uh, of economic theory does not uh, associate with uh, specifically fully neoliberal horizontal uh, kind of, of policies. Uh, IPR, uh, look, one way or another for any private inv- uh, agent or uh, to invest in the capabilities, the agent has to feel comfortable that he will reap benefits. Uh, the Chinese do this. The Chinese are on the on the tr- uh, exactly on the drive to 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 boost the IPR of the innovations. Uh, now that they are there, so uh, there is always a balance to be found. But uh, please, the the idyllic uh, world of uh, having no IPR because it is exclusive might lead us to have no, uh, let's say, broad based adaptation of technologies. And, and that applies including to trade. Uh, Maria's uh, and, and Tomaso's paper at some moment referred to the need to go cautious about uh, sometimes uh, even eventually postponing the entry into G- uh, global value chains and so on. Well, there is always a cost for that because that means time foregone in learning. So a balance has to be found between, let's say, uh, inclusive inclusiveness. It's something that depends on, on ne- not necessarily on technology. Inclusiveness uh, means uh, social protection systems, means mechanisms that ensure income distribution, that ensures the, the, the weight of the poor on, on, the, the, on the demand formation. And, uh, and so my, my, my call is simply to call attention to destructive incentives because they matter if we want the agents investing in creating capabilities. That's that's all. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, um, Gabriela. Yes. Uh, let me take, take uh, one question from the from the participant related to the power relationship and the influence of power relationship on technological capability accumulation. So we, we are the, exactly the, the, the 
the politics, uh, the politics uh, subsistence of society or, or affairs into our analysis. And definitely we, we believe that power relationships have affect this process. Who are more powerful in, in, any, in one country? The, are the, the scientists powerful, the people related with technology, the productive, uh, the, the, the actors connected to the agriculture sector, all these influence what the, the direction of technological capability accumulation in different sectors, this influence if science is going to, to get resource for, for research of if we are going to have money for uh, supporting technolo technological development and innovation. So in, in that sense, in our paper, we try to introduce some indicators related with power relationship. And now in, in, in a work that now uh, we, are, we are starting a research project, we are starting looking at the case of Mexico into more, more uh, details, we, we, what we are trying to understand is which type of problem variable, variables related to the economy, to, to the politics, no? to the science, to the technology, the firms take into account in order to take decisions related to uh, accumulation of technological capabilities. Thanks. Very good. Um, thank you, Gabriela. Uh, uh, Tillman. Uh... Okay. Are you addressing? Are, are you addressing this? There is also a big comment. If you see on the chat, did you? See yes, yes, yes. I read that, yeah. and, 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 and let me let me briefly respond to Ottaviano's uh, comment, and then go to the question in the chat. Um, I, I I fully agree. I'm, I've always been pushing for more integration of innovation systems research with uh, traditional economics, uh, even if it's neoclassical. Which, I mean, many people don't like the term, but I think the the links between the incentive systems, the macroeconomic and microeconomic um, foundations, and the innovation research needs to be strengthened. So I'm 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 very grateful for for that uh, comment. But then, uh, whenever one talks about what are the appropriate framework conditions or the appropriate incentives, I'm I'm. Uh, I hate the word appropriate unless it's qualified, right? And and whether your understanding is that of, of kind of appropriate, kind of investing in, in a very specific technological capability in a, in a vertical way, or whether it is the doing business agenda or so, or in the IPR case, for example, I mean, it's, it's always about balancing. I mean, China was very smart in not respecting IPR in the first place. And when they became innovators, they started respecting IPR. So it has a lot to do with sequencing and, and smart mixes, etc. So, and I think we shouldn't be, uh, we should be as, as open-minded as possible and rather than orthodox and, and try to see what, what, what works in, in, in specific real world uh, conditions. On, on the capability ladder, <clears throat> I mean, the, the message was a bit, okay, once countries have moved to the innovation frontier, <clears throat> there's more flexibility. Then they have the capability that um, they can easily, okay, if they have automotive diesel engine capabilities, they can switch them to electric vehicle, whatever. No, So, because then they... But, 80% of the countries are below that level and, and, and most of them, as we see, never get there really. So the, the key question for me really is what does it mean to up um, trajectories that um, 70, 80% of the type of technologies and licenses that we are borrowing are no longer functional in a, in a, in a, in a decarbonized world. And just finally on the question, in the, in the chat, which I think is a very good one, it, 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 implicitly it has several questions. What do countries, low-income countries that don't, that are not at the technological frontier, what can they do to benefit from from the green economy? Right, and that's exactly the, the question um, that we are addressing in in in, um, um, in in the world development special issue that we are just adding in. I see Rasmus Lema is also here on the on the chat. He is, he just edited a book on, on green uh, windows of opportunities where we look at um, what, what are the, the 
what's in it for developing countries in, in going green. And there are a lot of, of uh, very interesting things. And, and uh, for, for example, uh, related to renewable energies and then um, uh, developing uh, green hydrogen industries on the basis of renewables and then co-locating energy intensive industries uh, but also within traditional value chains no, to, to, um, um, uh, to uh, exploit possibilities for kind of organic labels and so on. And I think there's a wealth of, of things. And I think the notion that uh, green growth, I mean, un unless you're Denmark uh, and, and invest inventing the wind turbine, uh, you will not benefit from, from the green transformation. I think that's a simplistic notion of, of, the, of, of, of greening. And, and uh, developing countries have a lot of greener economies, for example, would uh, tax uh, environmental bads and, and untax labor, for example, right? And then um, uh, uh, developing countries usually have an advantage in labor costs and, and can make advantage of that. And or they have, uh, some have tropical climates, et cetera. So, so a, a horticulture product from Kenya or Ethiopia with a carbon label on it would be more competitive than one from the Netherlands created in a greenhouse uh, with, with uh, fossil fuel. Uh, inputs, etc. No? So there are lots of, of um, 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 uh, things where, where developing and especially low income countries would also benefit. Uh, Tillman, can you repeat the title of that book you mentioned uh, with these opportunities? Well, there, there's, um, uh, uh, there are two things that we are also co-promoting now. One is the, uh, I think, well, Rasmus can promote it if he's still on, online. It's uh, Green Windows of Opportunity. I think it's a special issue. And, 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 and I have just edited within, uh, uh, with a colleague, Anna Pegels, one on uh, latecomer development in a greening world. So, so with, I think, 11 or 12 case studies of, of developing countries benefiting from the transformation. It's all online. Yeah, very good. Uh, this is excellent. Excellent. I think Jose uh, is trying to intervene. Uh, uh, Jose. Uh, uh, <laughs> short. Okay, I'm going to be short. I really enjoyed <laughs> Otaviano's comments. Uh, I just would like to come in on the this uh, possibility of learning from more orthodox economics. And, and in general, I would say that, uh, I mean, it is, it is a possibility. However, nowadays we have many other options to pursue as well. Something that I really like about the papers that we have seen during this session is that actually the, the, the complexity of, of the economic analysis is increasing. In fact, many of the factors that normally have been considered like external or contextual nowadays has been endogenized. And I think that that's a really interesting um, uh, way of dealing with new problems because sustainability, inclusion, social political factors, relation, uh, power relations in terms of national innovation systems development and of course, technological capability accumulation processes um, are very unlikely to be like well considered in more reductionist approaches. And uh, instead of that, um, trying to move on a more complex wave of, of analyzing and um, moving forward the, the knowledge in that field, I think it, it might be something more interesting or suitable for, for nowadays problems. That's my only comment. Very good, thank you. Um... I want to, to, to stress that we have people on YouTube uh, watching, they, they cannot speak, but they, they send us messages. So we have, we have a series of, 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 of things here that they have asked. Let me, let me ask one, which is different from, from what we've discussed until now. Uh, Delman Guka is asking um, whether the lack of future vision for individual countries really affects um, their chances of, of success. So uh, do we need vision, uh, I guess, from higher ups? Uh, this, is, this is the question the way I, I understand it. Uh, it seems to me that if countries do not know the direction of movement, any kind of STI could uh, mislead to um, uh, the, the stuff. What do you think, anyone? Um, my answer would be directly yes, of course. <laughs> right. Yes, may I come in here? I, 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 I would 
agree. I think this directionality matters a lot. And, and for example, I mean, wh whatever concrete case you take, I mean, in Brazil, for example, needs to see how much do they invest now in Petrobras, assuming that basically the oil industry could be a, a, a stranded assets. If you look, took the, take the steel industries, they, they need to get prepared to a low carbon world where well, uh, low carbon steel will be on demand where, where uh, there will be carbon border adjustment measures and things like that for high carbon steel. So uh, whether it's about um, uh, the bus industry, for example, producing diesel buses and, and now uh, uh, China's leapfrogging ahead on electric buses. So a company like Marco Polo, should it learn from BYD in, the, in, in China and those and so on. So all this requires putting efforts together in terms of um, uh, research capabilities in terms of company uh, strategies, in terms of um, uh, training programs, in terms of all cluster development, etc. Unless you have a vision of where the, the broad mega trends are moving, you, you don't get anywhere. And of course, it's, it, it's not kind of micro engineering private markets. No, it's about having a broad vision about the corridor of where to go. And then within the corridor, you have all sorts of private sector and market-driven experimentation. But I think defining the corridors is, is, is essential. Very good. Action. Thank you. Uh, Tomasu. Tomasu, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. No, I was going to pick up also that discussion, which is very important. Thanks, Luke, again, for, <clears throat> for another very, very interesting comment. I think, the, in my view, the, the, the main issue that I have with your question is about the singular you have future vision. Uh, I think that's problematic. It is problematic because uh, the future vision um, without the S um, means that this vision will be determined by somebody. Who's going to be that somebody? Who's going to have that vision? And I think we fall again in the same trap of exclusion that we've been discussing uh, before. Um, unless you include in those visions, plural, um, the perspective of those uh, who are less commonly included in those decision making to think about the vision, um, then we'll keep having equality and exclusion. Then it will only be the interest uh, and innovating towards the interest and including in innovation towards the interest of only those who have access to make this vision. So I would be a little bit cautious about what that visions are and who determine those visions and, uh, and what is the process for creating those visions. And I think there is where you have to start being <coughs> inclusive. Otherwise, uh, you, you will always increase in the quality. Okay, uh, good point, thank you. Uh, let me read the comment from Andrew Cummings. Uh, in the process of structural transformation to a sustainable and inclusive techno-economic development paradigm, uh, could you talk about the systematic actor capabilities required to scale up from innovation in micro localized niches uh, to have a wider societal impact? This is the question. How do we scale up, especially in context of resource scarcity uh, and unequal power relations in the global south? <laughs> An easy question. <laughs> Who wants to address this? How do we scale up from the local um, to the, the bigger scale? Uh, Tomas. I think Tomas. Yeah, Tomas. Yeah, no, sorry. I just, I just give my <laughs> my view. Thanks, thank you. It's, I think it's uh, you know if 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 we knew. Uh, we would be in a, probably in a much better world. Um, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, again, it's, um, it's about giving an, an, an opportunity. It's about being able to listen here. It's about being able to uh, include, the, and this is the argument that, 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 that we make. And I think this is where the main discussion with, in, in, my, in my case, the main discussion with, with, with what Taviano would be, is that <clears throat> in order to have, uh, to give, uh, space uh, to those niches, uh, we need something which is not horizontal. We need, we need incentives, particularly for those uh, niches to become more relevant. Now, again, 
when do you determine when something is more relevant than, than something else at the at the county level? That's extremely difficult. And obviously we have market competition. So if something becomes uh, more relevant because it's, it's more efficient, uh, fine. Um, but uh, but, but, but we, we, we also tend, uh, and this is what happens, uh, to follow in this way, uh, but dependence and we follow, we, we enter in lock-ins where some of these uh, niches, as we know, will never emerge uh, because they will never be able to compete uh, with, uh, with incumbents. So, so I think it's, 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 it's what uh, Ottaviano on its hand. We need incentives uh, for uh, some of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of these niches to keep investing and emerge. And we need to tweak a little bit uh, the market incentives uh, with, with some intervention uh, because of the, of the, of the well-known market failures in order to allow some of these niches to become more efficient, even if they're not in, in a given moment, than the incumbent uh, predominant uh, technologies. Okay, thank you. I want to, uh, to invite Jo Distor um, to say something. She, uh, 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 I think, uh, Jody. Hi, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I still can't figure out how to raise my hand, but thanks for inviting me. So um, I just one uh, response on that question about scale up. I, I think one aspect of it is, is about connectivity, not, not, not purely or primarily ICTs, but um, in terms of what's happening in individual niches, the more that they are networked both um, horizontally, I suppose you would say, in terms of with others um, uh, of sim at, a, at a similar level, but also networked vertically, so networked from individual communities to, to, to cities or to national level. I think there's, there's a scaling that can happen through, um, through replication that is context relevant in different niches um, rather than the, the sort of scale we imagine um, in the more traditional uh, sort of business perspective through, um, through large, large scale companies. Um, let me just also, I put a, a comment in the chat box very briefly, which was in response to one of the earlier questions about smart, um, smart cities and the potential to be more inclusive. I think it depends very much on how those policies are implemented. And it goes back to Tommaso's comment from a minute ago about different visions and different assumptions and different perspectives that are built into that. So if that smart city vision and assumption is related to um, a certain type of, um, of, of sort of uh, technology or um, a certain um, assumption about formality or informality is the comments that I, I put in the chat box that often urban policy is quite discriminatory towards the informal sector, seeing that as, you know, bad or not part of the vision of what a good urban development looks like. But uh, policies that can work with informality, uh, helping them to improve quality, productivity, etc., cetera, um, I, th I think then can be more inclusive. And I think that can be translated into the smart city context, although that's not my uh, expertise. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Very good, thank you. Um, Somebody is asking uh, uh, what uh, what is the role of uh, multinational corporations in in this thing with, with backward countries? Uh, how about uh, he's asking how about uh, obliging them to open up their IP a little bit earlier than they do usually? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe. Sure, tell me. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that is absolutely um, right, especially where public goods are concerned. I think we need to make a difference whether it is IPR for private goods or whether it is for things like um, critical drugs, no? HIV AIDS, for example, is an example, or it could also be in terms of decarbonization. So I think there are several options to to, to say, okay, for example, the global community pays for, uh, for, for patents or we have exceptions for, um, for usage in, in, in poor communities or low-income countries or so. So I think that it's about how to balance the, the legitimate interests of the inventors 
and but that can also be shaped in different ways. So I, it, it, property rights don't have to be guaranteed for for a very long uh, period, etc. No? And I think overall we need to think more about. Um, I mean, there's also Matsukato's work about uh, fund public uh, institutions funding research on common goods, but then private corporations extracting the benefits, right? So I think we need to have a new social contract there between corporations and, and, and the states in terms of um, ensuring that uh, the fruits of innovations are, some, are, are also shared. And clearly the key dif- distinction here is between private goods and, 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 and research for, for global public goods. And overall, I think that's a ne- neglected research agenda, how to organize research governance for global commons, for global public goods. I mean, we have interests in a group in institutes like the CGIAR network of agricultural research institutes. They are, well, interesting, an interesting um, organizational setup because they're publicly funded. There's a, there are bodies that jo- jointly define the research agenda. They have rules for sharing the, the fruits of IPRs, et cetera. No? And, and uh, different uh, for different uh, public goods, you have different arrangements no? in, in energy or in earth observation or in medical research, etc. And I think uh, working on, on the best um, governance structure in the sense of uh, contributing to, um, to, to, to global societal challenges, that's uh, something that is, is really clearly underexplored. May I go ahead? May I Nick, very very briefly because Tillman's remarks give me the great opportunity to highlight what I have in mind when I talk about incentives, neoclassicals, and so on. It's always a matter of balance. And 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 he referred to the Brazilian agriculture, whose success, at least when it comes to soybeans and and, and sugarcane, uh, if they are mostly a public-private partnership that included uh, research on new seeds done by semi-public institutions with the use, with the application, with the appropriation of the results by the agriculture producers who introduced them. See, we don't have to be horizontal, but we do not, there is a limit uh, 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 below which uh, the, the, the public drive has to stay at a broader generic level because the materialization of the capabilities of the use of the technologies has to have embedded incentives. Agents will only do that if they see a gain for that, uh, which applies in the case of the IPR. Of course, answering the question, of course, any country say no multinational will come to my place if they don't open their IPR. Okay, unless you have something really very attractive to offer, like China had, uh, you will not get it. Uh, so let's be realistic. And, and the attempts to create, uh, 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 let's say, alternative has not worked. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Maria, Maria, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I w- I w- that's something I'm... I'm, I'm... I'm uh, thinking aloud now. Uh, is is partly in response to um, to the scalability question that I wanted to add a footnote to what Thomas and Jody had already said, and um, and also repressing this issue of incentives um, by Ottaviano, which is really intriguing. I mean, I, I've been <laughs> dealing with this for, for a long time. I think what my uh, help scalability and also might help include. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. And also, what might help inclusion as well is um, what about we, we create incentives to be represented? I mean, I, what I can say is, is, is sca- scalable actors such as large union or uh, uh, policymakers, but also civil servants that actually might be as intermediaries between high-level uh, policymakers and, and, uh, and the citizens and so on. I think probably one incentive that is missing here or in, in, in economies is for people to get, uh, uh, to get represented. 
and therefore act as a collective actor and, and uh, enter into what Tillman was saying, a new social contract. I'm just wondering how would you get a new social contract if, if segments of the population remains excluded? But uh, probably one, uh, one issue could be creative, creating incentives to be represented. And this is something that uh, might help um, innovation, but also uh, inclusion and scalability. So uh, apologies, I'm not familiar with the niche uh, jargon despite being at SPRU, but I think, uh, I think we must be reasoning in, this, uh, in these terms. Uh, creating incentives to be represented and have more voices in the uh, policy decisions that, uh, that affect innovation and structural transformation. Um, besides obviously the incentives that Ottaviano talks about, like incentives for firms and the private sectors, but also incentives for other actors to, uh, to enter the, the uh, policy decisions. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. I think um, at, you know, on this tone, unless somebody has a very, very important statement to make, a closing statement, I think at this, at this point, we will um, end this, this excellent discussion. Actually, it has been an excellent discussion. And, and, and I want to mention that there are two more opportunities to continue. The next one is exactly a month from today. You will see the, the announcement soon. And there will be a final one where we will wrap up and we will discuss everything. I mean, it will be an open discussion to all this. Um, so um, uh, I know that there are people on the audience who did not have the, 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 the chance to talk, like uh, uh, Paolo Zavislak, who actually is, is organizing a major event with some of the top names that you know in the field, like uh, David Tees and Dick Nelson and Franco Malerba. Um, I will have I will have the chance to participate. It's uh, in in April. I know um, Paulo. Are you here? If he hears us, maybe. Um, I don't know if he's uh, around. I saw him earlier. And 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 actually, there is exactly this micro macro. Uh, how do we get these complementary capabilities um, at the micro level in order to to agree with the more macro aspirations that we have. Um, okay, um, <clears throat> I think I want to thank everybody. Everybody I know, many, many people here are, are, are very busy. So thank you for being with us for two hours now. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the chapters, for the presentations, for the discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>